thank you all for coming today on this rainy night. I've written this book about communities in America where the lawyers have stopped checking each other. And the most important message I want to give you tonight is that communities need to be more engaged with their courts. So what I'd like to do right now is explain to you how I came to write this book, tell you some of the stories that are in it, and then give you a sense of what can be done. So now I'm going to take you back to 2001. I had just graduated law school, and I was writing a series of stories for The Nation magazine about civil rights. And this gave me an opportunity to sit in a bunch of different courts. And I ended up uh, sitting in a courtroom in Greene County, Georgia. Uh, it's it's a really a quite beautiful county. Uh, President Bush vacationed there three times during his presidency because his largest fundraiser li lived there. And I walked up the green carpeted stairs to the courtroom, and I saw a swarm of people around the public defender. Uh, they were waiting for about two minutes to speak with him. He would call out their name, Mr. Jones, are you here? And then he would t convey to them what the prosecutor was offering, the, the deal that the prosecutor was offering. And then that defendant would go um, and wait on these hard wooden benches and wait for um, the judge to call his or her name. And uh, another lawyer would stand by his side. And this lawyer knew even less than the first lawyer. And he would plead guilty. Now, basically, over two days, I watched 48 people plead guilty in this way, which is quite a lot. And in court, it was obvious that the lawyer didn't know anything about these people. Cases would break down. In the middle, someone would say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that I was going to jail. Wait, I, I, and, and all of a sudden, you know, they, they would uh, put the case off to a different day. Um, people would start to cry in the middle and say I, they didn't understand what was happening to them. It really looked like chaos. And so afterwards, I went and I interviewed the judge and the prosecutor and the defense attorney. And I said, so how do you think it went? And they all said the same thing, which was fine. And when I uh, interviewed the defense attorney, he said something that I'll never forget. He said, nobody was treated bad. Nobody could say that they didn't, didn't have their day in court. Now, during this a two year period, Cerency represented, his name is Robert Cerency, he represented twice the number of people that the American Bar Association recommends as the absolute maximum that he could represent. And he boasted, he said, we have successfully done a 10-page calendar in one day, as if speed equaled success. Now, what astonished me, and what made me want to write a book, is that smart, committed, hardworking professionals could routinely act in ways that fell short of what it was that people in their positions were supposed to be doing and not even realize that anything was missing or that their behavior had devastating consequences for regular people's lives. So this became the, the genesis of ordinary injustice. So this is ordinary injustice. It's that mistakes become routine and the legal professionals can no longer see their role in them. Now, there was something else that happened that day. There was this man sitting next to me, and his name was Steve Bright, and he's the head of the Southern Center for Human Rights. I had told him that I was coming down and was going to be sitting in this courtroom, and he was bringing a series of lawsuits against the county, against, against the state, and dif against different uh, counties in the state. And he said, well, if you're going to be there, I've never seen that courtroom, I'll come see it too. So he's sitting next to me. And it was incredibly hard to hear on that day. The, there were these dark, long wooden benches, and people were rustling in their seats. And the judge and the prosecutor and the defense attorney were all sort of huddled at the front of the room. And Steve turned to me and said, you know, you're supposed to be taking notes for your story. You, you can't hear anything. I said, I know. It's just terrible. And he said, well, why don't you ask the judge to speak up? And I said, Steve, I'm not going to do that. This is court, and I'm here as a neutral observer. So I went back to trying to strain to hear, and I couldn't hear anything. So all of a sudden, Steve 
stands up, raises his hand, and he says, Your Honor, if you wouldn't mind, please speak up. Thank you very much. And he sits down. All eyes turn to Steve, okay? It's like a pall has come over this place, and the place is packed, and everyone's looking in our direction. And the judge says, who are you? Come before me. And Steve said, he stood up. He said, no, Your Honor, I just want you to speak up. Thank you very much, and sits back down. She orders him to come before him, and he climbs over all the legs, you know, stands before the judge, and he basically takes over the court. And he says, Your Honor, we're all here. We're missing work. We've left our children in the care of others. This is a public hearing. If you wouldn't mind, please speak up. Okay, the place goes crazy. Everyone's clapping and, and, and saying, ah, oh, man, that's right. We can't hear. This is a public hearing. What? And, and, and uh, Steve is a hero in the, in the breaks. Everyone wants to talk to him. And the judge says, shush, 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 shush. There's a lot of interest here today. I'm going to get a microphone because, you know, my voice, I'm not feeling well. I, 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 I'm going to get a microphone so everyone can hear. So uh, she has a microphone installed. And for the rest of the day, everybody could hear. The next day, I went back to court, and the microphone was gone. And I was able to follow up on this court for the next five years. There was never another microphone. You could never hear. And there was always that huddle. That huddle is what my book is about. My book is about professionals, people like you and me, who become more attached to the people we work with than performing the checks that make the adversarial system work. So I got this idea that I wanted to write a book how regular people were treated in the criminal justice system. But what I found is that problems were often misdiagnosed. I went to a county, and I want to take one step before I tell you. I'm telling you about, next about a county in Mississippi. But the book does move north. Uh, I'm telling you about Georgia and Mississippi first. But we do eventually get to New York and Chicago. So I don't want you to think that the problems are just in the south. So I, I, next I decided to go to this county in Mississippi. I, at this point, I kind of thought that I was going to be writing about indigent defense alone. And when I got there, there were very few people in, in court. It wasn't this you know, stream of people, this mill that I saw in Georgia at all. In fact, there were only eight defendants the first time I went to court in Mississippi. And so I started passing out my card and saying, if you know any defendants, and but what I got were these incredible phone calls from people who gave my card to other people who had stories of injustice. But I couldn't see what the pattern was. So I went to the court clerk, and she's a woman named Miss Wiggs. She has a helmet of white hair and these bright blue eyes and this really plain uh, way of talking. And she really was an independent thinker. Above um, her desk were these enormous shelves and there were these bound volumes of marriage records. And until 1988, they were kept separate as colored and white until she came into office and said, why are we keeping these records separate and changed it? Uh, I, I said to Ms. Wiggs, what is going on here? And she's like, you want to know what's going on? Let me show you. And she pulls down a list of mimeographed names from her wall that she's pasted together. And these were all cases where people had been charged with crimes in a, a lower court. And then a, a justice court judge had bound the cases over to grand jury. Okay, so what this means is that, by law, the prosecutor had an obligation to bring these cases to grand jury to give the people a chance to decide whether or not these defendants should be properly charged. But when court happened, there were, you know, 50-something names on the list, there was only a handful, eight people. So I said, well, who, what's wrong with these cases? Why weren't they brought? And Ms. Wiggs said, I have no idea. People call here. You know, one woman just called and said her house was broken into three times in one week. Um, you know, she, the, people have had horrible things happen to them, and I just referred them to the prosecutor. I don't know. So I took this list, and I used it as a road map to find out what was going wrong in Quitman County. And what I found was 
that entire categories of crime had disappeared.